Hello class, this is Professor Allen, and here is Lecture Day 23 of American History. And we're picking up right where we left off in the classroom on Tuesday with the Panic of 1837. And so I had mentioned the Panic of 1837 at the end of last time, and had also kind of said that Andrew Jackson vetoing the renewal of the charter of the Second National Bank was going to help cause it. But it's not just that that caused it, but multiple things. And so let's talk about the major causes of the Panic of 1837, which was a massive economic depression our country faced um, in the 1830s to 40s. And so the four major causes are the government over expenditure and then some bad bank loans which kind of happened because of the over expenditure as well as those small banks that we talked about last time and so the federal government had actually been selling acres upon acres of land actually 40 million acres of land and that land speculation and of course you know surveying the land and then selling that land to private owners in the Midwest as well as um, in the South, such as around Arkansas, Mississippi, Alabama area, really brought in a lot of cash for the federal government over the years. And while that was great, the federal government actually had a spending problem because what it ended up doing was it ended up actually selling or lending money to small private companies that decided to build canals and roads around the country as well, as well as in those you know, new areas. And while it was doing that, many of those small companies didn't finish the canal or didn't finish the road they were supposed to build. And uh, eventually they would have been paid for um, or gotten that money back, you know, of course, to the federal government by having a toll on the road or a toll on the canal for being used. But when these roads and canals aren't finished, those small, small businesses don't end up making that money back and so are unable to pay the government back on this the money that they had loaned out and so they kind of default on the loan and you know they end up going bankrupt these small little businesses that were building these place uh things but what does that help the federal government not at all um the federal government just isn't able to get the money back at all a bunch of businesses also fail due to bad loans um from the uh, small banks around the country deciding to spend out, uh, hand out money to people hoping they'd fail. We've talked about that in class now twice, and so there's no need, reason to go over it again. And so when the people aren't able to pay the money back to the sm small bank, they go bankrupt and lose their business. And it actually affects a lot more than I've kind of mentioned in the past. About one third of the entire population of America becomes unemployed due to this. And then we also mentioned last time species circular, where species circular is the idea that gold and silver, um, actual coinage, okay, actual gold and silver coins were the only viable currency allowed to be used to pay taxes or pay any kind of payment to the government itself. And President Andrew Jackson kind of started that. Um, and then uh, Van Buren, who took over the presidency after Jackson um, uh, ran out, you know, after his eight years, Van Buren became president. And so uh, during Van Buren's presidency, that idea is continued because Van Buren carried along, along a lot of Jackson's previous policies. Um, banknotes right here have no value, meaning basically checks, okay, checks, um, and they didn't have credit cards back then, obviously, so that's not going to be able to be used to pay the federal government or anything like that. And then we end up having a grain failure across the entire nation. Um, some climate issues ended up popping up and having a really bad winter, um, which ended up, oh, early winter, sorry, ended up causing a bunch of um, grain harvests across the entire country to fail. Um, they ended up freezing, uh, and so the, the wheat just died, and so they're not able to make bread, bread or anything like that. And so we end up actually having a massive food shortage across the entire country. And with that food shortages, prices of food that is available go up. And that means people are paying a lot more money for the same amount of food that they were beforehand and paying less. And so when you've got one third of the population unemployed, uh, that's going to cause a lot of issues with this food shortage and the prices rising. And then 
the others that actually can afford um, things and do actually have jobs are now paying more money for the same amount of food as they were a year or two earlier. And so they're actually going down economically as well. Uh, and so it really is really bad, um, just kind of from these four major issues. Um, and it doesn't really get better anytime soon. Um, it actually lasts five years up into about the 1840s sometimes. Of course, it starts in 18 1837, this economic depression. And it lasts roughly to about 1842. Um, some people say it could actually last, it, it technically lasted a little bit longer, depending on the person and the area of the country. Um, some people were obviously hit harder than others. And so 1842, give or take, okay? Um, trade unions during this time collapse because the whole point of being in a union was that you and a bunch of other workers in the same kind of profession of you could stand up to management, okay, and stand up to the big company owners and stuff. And so you could say, hey, we want better better wages or better hours of, you know, or better working place conditions. And so those were really important. But when all of a sudden companies are just shutting down, um, people are like, well, what's the point of being in a union right now? I'm just going to not even join a union because there's no point, because they're not going to be able to stop the company from collapsing and kind of thing. So a bunch of uh, unions end up also collapsing because people are just not paying the dues into the union to help out the union or whatever like that, or being even joining them. Um, President Van Buren takes the blame of the Panic of 1837, just like whenever an economic depression hits a country um, or any kind of massive um, inflation or economic crisis hits a country, the person in charge at the time always takes the hit, okay, politically. Um, however, it usually is caused by the guy beforehand. Um, and in this case, it really was caused under Jackson. Van Buren didn't help matters, but he kind of comes into the presidency in his first year and all of a sudden, oh no, all of this is going to hell, you know, economically for him. And it wasn't caused by his one year of being a president. Um, it was caused beforehand or even less than a year in some cases. Um, it was really the national bank issue under his predecessor, Andrew Jackson, um, that helped as well as these four issues, which had been kind of happening over the past, you know, few presidencies or beginning to, um, as well, especially, you know, species, species circular was definitely under Jackson and Van Buren, so they could take the hit for that, um, and Van Buren should be blamed for that part, but not everything was all Van Buren's fault. Van Buren, however, did come up with a plan to try to fix it, um, and it was the idea of having no private banks, like the small little private banks that had been having the, um, government money, take that federal money back and put it in the federal treasury. Um, and hopefully things would end up getting better over time because those small banks wouldn't be spending out the federal money. Um, and maybe we can use the federal money to help in other ways. Um, that helps a little bit, but really what ends up having to happen is a whole lot of other economic changes where um, it just takes time. And that's why it takes about five years, this entire um, economic depression. Economic depressions do typically last several years. Moving on into a slightly different subject, obviously, is there at this time in America, there is beginning to be a large anti-slavery sentiment, okay, meaning people that do not like slavery in the country. And so let's start with William Lloyd Garrison right here. Um, he actually began a newspaper in Boston, Massachusetts, called The Liberator, called The Liberator. That was his name of the newspaper, and it's actually a, you know, big headline right there, pictured of what it would look like, the front page, right, of it. And in this newspaper, he constantly wrote about, or had other writers write about, uh, wanting emancipation of all the slaves, meaning freeing all the slaves is emancipation. He also says in the newspaper, or he and other writers, um, saying that they wanted equal rights for women, okay? Um, which, those are two kind of cutting-edge um, 
ideas back then, emancipating all the slaves. Yes, it was becoming a bigger deal back then across America, um, but this paper definitely helps. And then when all of a sudden the same reader is now reading about equal rights for women, um, that's a big, big, big deal back then in America, as well as, you know, worldwide at this time. The 1830s um, and beforehand were not very good for women, um, you know, when it came to polit politics or even being treated equally. Um, and so this was kind of a big deal that a newspaper in a large American city, such as Boston, was actually publishing these ideas. Um, in 1833, an American Anti-Slavery Society forms, actually that is the name of it, and it is actually formed by not only just free blacks, but also whites. Uh, white people are also uh, joining this, and it's they are both coming together um, and deciding, yes, we want to free the slaves. We want to be anti-slavery, again, you know, across the whole country, and it's mostly supported in the North. Um, and so uh, it kind of starts taking root throughout the North and starts spreading over time from the 18th, from 1833 onwards. Um, but some places in the South would even have small, small groups of people, you know, pushing this as well. Although, you know, they were definitely the minority at that time in the South. Um, because remember, the South is heavily um, pushing slavery because of its um, plantation-based economy. Um, in the Liberator, as well as in the anti-American, or anti-slavery, um, sorry, not anti-American, the American Anti-Slavery Society, um, we end up actually having several fugitives, fugitive slaves, speaking about their experiences. Um, but they don't just actually speak about it in these two groups, or this paper and this um, group. They actually form um, a small little newspaper of their own. Frederick Douglass does that. This man right here, pictured there. Frederick Douglass actually creates a newspaper called the North Star. The North Star. And this newspaper actually ends up um, interviewing people such as Solomon Northrup, William Craft, and his wife Mary Craft. And these um, former fugitive slaves, they were escaped slaves um, that escaped to the North and escaped to freedom, ended up actually speaking about their experiences of slavery, okay, and what it was like as slaves. And when people read the North Star, or as well as when they did interviews, as well as other people doing interviews in the Liberator, or as well as doing um, speeches in front of the meetings of the American Anti-Slavery Society, people ended up getting riled up, wanting to spread more ideas of anti-slavery, okay? And it ended up actually working over time, at least in the North, for the most part. Southern slave owners and anti-abolitionists in Congress, however, became very angry at this anti-slavery mo movement. And now, obviously, abolition is the idea of, you know, freeing the slaves, right? Um, or abolishing slavery, rather. Um, and so anti-abolitionists are the ones that want slavery, okay? And want to keep slaves. And so um, they in the South are really angry about this. And so obviously, the South back then, just like today, elects members to Congress and Senate in the federal government. And so um, those members of Congress and the Senate um, were very outspoken in the Senate and Cong House of Representatives about any time someone mentioned slavery, they were like, whoa, no, we're not, we're not breaching that subject, was the, um, and they'd get into big arguments. Um, and so in the 1830s and 1840s, um, issue, this issue had become very, very large. And in fact, there were violent attacks on people that proposed abolition, including William Lloyd Garrison. He was actually attacked physically by people um, uh, that disliked him and disliked his newspaper. And it got to the point where in Congress... Members of Congress were actually kind of almost to the point where they would get into actual fights with each other. Um, they didn't, but it could have happened um, until in 1831, the House of Representatives passed a rule called the Gag Rule, where they were no longer allowed to have an anti-slave petition even brought up for a vote or even discussion in the U.S. House of Representatives. Okay, at first, and then they enlarged that gag rule so that they made it so that you could not even debate or bring up slavery or abolition at all 
in the U.S. House of Representatives in Washington, D.C. You couldn't even bring it up for a comment, okay? Couldn't talk about slavery at all because people of the South would get angry if it was an anti-slavery um, discussion, and people in the North, if it was a pro-slavery discussion, would get angry as well, okay? And so no petition about slavery or ending it were e was even allowed to be put into public record from 1831 onwards, okay? Um, and so slavery became this kind of hot topic in not just the public, but in Congress, where our own government refused to even discuss it anymore um, due to possible arguments. Moving on. Uh, this anti-slavery um, reaction and all kind of continued to the point where a really big, you know, deal happened when a Spanish ship called the La Amistad, ended up actually coming to America. Now, the story about it is quite kind of interesting. There's even a movie um, uh, on it with Matthew McConaughey, um, Anthony Hopkins, Morgan Freeman, and uh, Demon Honshu. Um, it, so I do recommend you see the movie, um, because it's a really good one. Um, but um, let's talk a little bit about the history of the ship and how this becomes an issue in America when it's a Spanish ship. Okay, and this happens in the year 1839. And so this Spanish ship called the La Amistad is actually trying to illegally import, you know, smuggle 53 slaves from Africa, directly from Africa into America. Well, during the voyage across the Atlantic Ocean, okay, these 53 slaves or several of them actually are able to break free from their captors and actually helped free some of the others and killed the crew of the Spanish ship. The captain and two sailors are actually able to survive this fight on the ship, and they're actually able to restore order, meaning that they basically recapture, recapture the 53 slaves, okay, and put them back in the jail on the ship, okay, and chain them up again, and, but it's only the three of them left, the captain and literally two sailors. And for steering a big ship like this, you know, that's not very easy. Three people. Um, you know, it, you had to have multiple people going up and down the, the rigging, you know, the masts with the sails and all, um, and doing a lot of other jobs on the ship all at once. And that's just really hard. And so by the time they were able to restore order and start navigating and figuring out where they were, because it was several hours of the fighting um, and all, they had kind of gone lost. And so they kind of started steering back towards Africa um, at first, and then they kind of got lost again when they decided to go back west, trying to back to go to back to America. They decided, okay, well, instead of heading back to Africa, um, let's actually just head head on to America and try to smuggle the, and get payment for these slaves um, that we're bringing. Well, eventually they ended up le reaching the coast of Connecticut and um, docking in Connecticut. Well, when it reached Connecticut, Connecticut is in the north of of the United States, and they had kind of gotten rid of slavery at that point. And so this Spanish ship reaches an area of the country that is against slavery. And then we also remember, if you may remember several lectures ago, we actually had a law passed in America saying that there were not to be any importation of new slaves into the country. And so they're breaking the law there. Well, this Spanish ship isn't an American ship, so we don't really have jurisdiction over the ship, but we can send them away or, you know, hold them because they have broken American law. Well, President Van Buren finds out about this. He wants to send the ship to Cuba because Cuba is the closest Spanish colony to America at the time, okay? They can sail down the American coast, get to Cuba, um, but because they have slaves on board and they've broken American law, the Supreme Court finds out about this and actually starts saying, okay, well, we're interceding into this. And the Supreme Court says, no, President Van Buren, you are not allowed to send it to Cuba just to get rid of this issue. Those Spanish sailors have broken American law by coming here and trying to smuggle slaves here. And so what ends up happening is the Supreme Court says, well, we're going to take up a court case having to do with this. And so, you know, some of the people are going to be on the side of 
Van Buren sent the ship away just to get rid of it and make it someone else's issue. Um, and other people are saying, no, those slaves should be freed because they came to an area which should be free. The 53 Af African um, that were still imprisoned stay on the ship during this trial. Okay, um, John Quincy Adams, actually former president, remember, um, who lost to Andrew Jackson in the um, in when he was trying to get reelected, is a court. I mean, is an a is a uh, lawyer, and he decides that he's going to defend these fifty three Africans and try to get them freedom. Okay, um, and so he actually defends them in a very long court case in eighteen thirty nine called the Amistad case, named after the ship. Um, and that's why the movie is named that as well. Um, and so this big court case in the Supreme Court um, ends up finally getting ruled on after two years in 1841. And the Supreme Court says, yes, those Africans should be free. We're not sending them to Cuba. Let the ship go. But the people, the 53 African slaves on the ship should be free. Well, by the time the court case had finally been ruled on, only 35 of the 53 slaves actually were still alive on the ship. Um, uh, several of it had died because of just, you know, they had been treated better than beforehand at the, by this point, but, you know, still s conditions on the ships, you know, really bad back then. So um, I do encourage you to watch the movie if you're interested in this subject, or, you know, just um, like any of those actors. It, it's a really good um, story, and it's a true story. Of course, they take some liberties in the story a little bit with it, though. But continuing on. Um, lead up to the Texas Revolution. So this is going to be the major topic for today, but there are several other uh, topics after this. And so um, the Texas Revolution is a really big deal, obviously, in Texas, but it's also kind of a big deal for America because it ends up, you know, getting us Texas, right? And how does that all happen? Well, um, in September, on September 16th of 1821, Mexico gained independence from Spain. Remember, all of Mexico, as well as California, South, um, a uh, large portion of Arizona, Nevada, etc., as well as Texas, all were a Spanish colony, okay? Well, that area was known as Mexico, I mean, as Mexico, okay? And Mexico even owned California and everything back then. They all earned independence from Spain, okay, um, through revolution, um, and a lot, and they actually celebrated on September 16th every year. Okay, in Mexico today. It is not to be confused with Cinco de Mayo. Most people here today in America think that Cinco de Mayo is, is the Mexican Independence Day, the 5th of May. Um, and that's when everyone loves tacos and margaritas and everything um, over here in America. Um, it is nothing to do with Mexican independence. In fact, the Cinco de Mayo um, festival, um, which is celebrated in Mexico but very small, um, is really just a ta is just about a celebration of a Mexican um, army victory against the French at the Battle of Pueblo uh, in 1862. Um, uh, you know. 40 years later. Um, <laughs> uh, it's a small little battle, too. It's not even a very big one, where some French ended up coming all the way to Fran from France trying to take over Mexico, and then realized after this battle, okay, well, that was a dumb idea. Um, that's what Cinco de Mayo is about. No, September 16th is actually Mexican independence. But how does that affect Texas? Well, obviously, Texas is part of Mexico back then. And a man named Stephen F. Austin, pictured here, was given a grant of land, meaning he was given a contract for a large portion of land in the year 1821, soon after this Mexican independence. And he was given that contract of land by the new Mexican government, okay? And they said, yes, pay us a bunch of money, you can farm and own this part of Texas, okay? Or this part of Mexico, which was part of Texas back then. And... So he ends up having people come from other places to Texas or Mexico back then um, and start settling on his land. We end up actually having a group of people living now in Texas, um, or rather Mexico, right? The former, I mean, part of Tex Mexico that is Texas today, um, called Texicans, where they are actually Spanish speakers, and that was one of the... I, parts about the contract is anyone that came to live on Stephen F. Austin's land had to speak Spanish, and they're supposed to be Catholic. Um, 
they could get away without being Catholic by just saying, oh, yes, I'm Catholic. Um, but they had to, you know, actually speak Spanish. So they were still speaking Spanish. Um, I mean, of course, they could also speak English, etc. Um, and many of them did. And actually, many of them learned Spanish as like a side language kind of thing. Um, but they were supposed to be Catholic, but you could kind of lie about that part. Um, and the Mexican government wouldn't know either way. Well... Over time, a lot of people from the Carolinas, Georgia, Tennessee, and Louisiana start coming to Texas, okay, because they find out that you can grow cotton really, really well in northern Texas, okay? It's like very much of the rest of the South, very lush, able to um, grow um, in places, uh, um, just like the rest of the South. And so with them, they brought slaves, okay? These Americans from the Carolinas, Georgia, Tennessee, and Louisiana start actually coming to Texas, northern Texas, bringing slaves with them. By 1835, okay, after only so many years, 14 years, only one in eight people in Mexico were Texicans, or at least the Texas part of Mexico were Texicans. Um, the other seven out of the eight did not speak Spanish, um, and were definitely not Catholic. Um, or some of them might have been Catholic, but definitely did not speak Spanish. Um, so we end up having a lot of people in this portion of Mexico, which again is Texas, um, that are actually not supposed to be there, according to Mexican law. From 1835 to 1836, Mexico decides, okay, well, we don't like this anymore, and we don't like all these immigrants coming to Mexico not speaking America, I mean, I mean speaking um, Spanish, and they're from America, we don't like this, so we're going to close borders. We're not going to let them come into Mexico anymore. And they also, they also outlaw slavery, saying slavery is now outlawed throughout all of Mexico, including the region of Texas that they own. Um, and so, in 1835 to 1836, the Americans living in Texas start feeling that they're kind of being ignored by the Mexican government, and they decide that, you know, whenever they have issues, they sometimes want to have help, um, especially if it's crime or anything, and so they decide to organize a militia, um, and they become known as the Texas Rangers, which is why the Texas Rangers are basically like the sheriff's department um, through, throughout all of Texas, okay? It's their, um, their, one of their main police forces in Texas today, um, but this is the start of it. Well, on, in 1835 to 1836, America's, the Americans from, obviously, the Carolinas, Georgia, Tennessee, Louisiana, and anywhere else that have come to uh, the Mexican or the Texan-owned part of Mexico, um, uh, sorry, the Mexican-owned part of Texas, sorry, um, start actually wanting that part of Texas to become its own state or own country. Um, and they kind of first say, hey, can we become our own country to Mexico? And Mexico's like, no. And they're like, well, can we become a separate state in your country of Mexico and be able to rule ourselves for the most part and then have, you know, federal laws by you? And Mexico's like, no. And then they send letters to the United States and they're like, hey, can we join America? And the United States government is like, well, aren't you part of Texas? And they're like, well, yes, technically. And they're like, no, we're not getting involved in that, um, is what America replies. So they're denied by both to become their own kind of separate state or separate country even, um, or even having their own separate government in Mexico or America still. Um, and so a lot of the people in the Americans living in Texas become very upset. And on October 2nd of 1835, several of them decide to start revolting okay, and fighting against the Mexican government. They want to become their own independent nation. They've been told no. Um, and they decide that Sam Houston, who happens to be a lawyer at the time, um, is a really good candidate as their basically president or their leader, okay? Um, they just kind of decide he's going to be our leader until we can get free. Um, well, the Mexican government at this time is actually controlled by a former military soldier in the Spanish army, but now he's part of, he's in charge of the Mexican army because, you know, he's, he's in charge. And he is the general and Mexican president, okay, a general of their army and is actual president of Mexico. His name is General Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana, okay, or just known as Santa Ana for the most part. Well, Santa Ana has an army of 1800 soldiers ready to attack the largest pocket of resistance 
of the Texas Revolt, and that is in San Antonio. A large group of um, Texans that want to break away and become their own Texas country have gone to San Antonio, and Santa Ana finds out about this, and he's like, okay, well, I can't track down all of them, including where Samuel Houston is, because they keep on moving around too quickly, but there is this one group of them that are staying put in San Antonio, so let me go take my army and crush them, and then after crushing them, I'll move on and hunt down Sam Houston and the rest of them, is the plan. So he ends up taking his 1,800 soldiers towards where the Texas uh, rebels are, or a large portion of them are, in San Antonio. And where are they hiding out at? Well, they're hiding out at the Alamo, where it really isn't hiding. Um, the Alamo is this half-built um, mission church, okay? And you actually can see it here. Um, and this is the actual church itself, this building right here. It doesn't even have a roof on it at the time. Um, it was, again, being constructed still. It was supposed to have a big giant church roof on it, um, but it never gets finished. There are several other buildings um, that make up the fort that the people def in San Antonio decide def to defend. Um, San Antonio is, of course, outside of this, um, like several, about a half a mile away, is the rest of the town of San Antonio. Um, there's just only these small buildings and this small um, half-built church is the actual Alamo, okay? And so, um, this is, you know, it's kind of on the outskirts of town, it's not really been finished yet, and a bunch of the defenders or the Houston, the rebels decide, okay, we're, we're going to use it and use it as a fort. And they end up actually constructing a few walls um, from the buildings to buildings um, with some bricks as well as even some wooden walls or palisades like we've talked about in the past. They end up bringing some cannons and put them on the corners and areas and stuff. Um, and so it's a relatively defended, okay, kind of makeshift fort, okay? Um, and who's in charge of these rebels in the Alamo? Well, again, Sam Houston is miles and miles and miles away in another portion of Texas. So someone else is in charge, and that man is William B. Travis, right here. Um, it's the only picture that we really have of him, um, and it's really just an artist's rendition of him, right? Um, and not a very good one. Um, we do have artist renditions of two other leaders, which we'll talk about in just a minute. William Travis, or Colonel, Lieutenant Colonel William Travis, was a member of the Texas Rangers, and, um, he had been promoted to that rank by Sam Houston to basically be in charge of the Alamo, okay, and the defenders at the Alamo. And and this is the Alamo today, what it looks like today. Um, obviously, it's this main building, and they finished a little bit more of it in the years since. Um, and it's now a museum. Um, but why is it become so important? Well, two other leaders end up going there to help out with William Travis. One of them is James Bowie, or Jim Bowie, as he becomes known as. Um, and he brings his Bowie knife, which he is very, very famous for. Um, he's actually from Kentucky, um, but lived in Louisiana for most of his adult life, or later on in his adult life, before coming to the Alamo. Um, and there's actually a story of him killing the parish sheriff of Rapides Parish, okay? The Rapides Parish Sheriff. And there's this big story where he used his Bowie knife, okay, which this blade is 12 inches long, just the blade. Um, it's about 18 inches from the tip of the handle all the way to the tip of the blade, this this knife. So it's it's almost like a small sword rather than a knife. Um, but he becomes very famous for this knife because he actually killed the Rapides Parish Sheriff with it. And there's a story that goes around where he ended up getting into this big giant fight in the bar with the Rapides Parish Sheriff, that the Sheriff had been hunting him down for a while or whatever. But it's really just speculation and embellishment over the years. Later on, Jim Bowie, as like, especially when he got to the Alamo, he was at the point of his life where he's like, I don't like that rumor being spread around, or he called it a rumor. Um, he basically said that the two of them got into a quick fight, him and the sheriff, and basically the sheriff fell on the knife when he was trying to defend himself, uh, Bowie that is. And so Bowie basically tries to downplay the story. Um, we're not exactly sure which is true now because of just how much it's embellished and 
and then Bowie and a few others saying, no, it wasn't a big deal. Um, but it, he did became famous because of it. Um, and the knife and the style of knife is now known as the Bowie knife because of this man right here. Um, another person that's famous uh, at this battle and one of the other two leaders um, uh, other than Travis, is, of course, Davy Crockett. And we talked about him last class, where he's actually a former House of Representatives member. Um, and I think that before that he was also a senator. Um, he was famous for playing the fiddle um, and very being kind of outdoorsy. He's also known for being, you know, uh, the outdoors type that has the coonskin hat and stuff and wears furs and goes hunting all for months and months at a time and lives out in the wilderness. Um, and he did that in Tennessee. Um, however, at this point, he's kind of retired from that outdoorsman kind of idea, and even got elected to the House of Representatives and Senator um, for Tennessee, and he was a good friend of President Jackson, and he was the person that jumped on the would-be assassin that I mentioned last time of Andrew Jackson. Um, and so Davy Crockett's a lot older than his young, pioneering version of himself, but he decides one last adventure go help these Americans in Texas gain their freedom. And so he, James Bowie, and about a dozen or so others go with them to the Alamo. Um, and so it brings the total of about uh, soldiers and family members at the Alamo from about 185 to 260. And that's not just soldiers. That also includes children and women, okay? Um, and so, and even a couple elderly um, adults that just are not capable of fighting, that are just family members of the rebels. And so they're all going to be defending the Alamo's, uh, the Alamo mission. Um, and from February 23rd to March 6th, or well, really March 4th, um, every single night when Al um, Santa Ana's army of 1,800 soldiers get there, they end up placing all their cannons around the fort itself, okay? And they would fire cannons and cannons and cannons up into the air, their big mortars and stuff, rain down cannon fire down onto the um, fort all night long, from sunset till dawn, every single night long, okay? Um, February 23rd all the way to March 4th. And what ends up happening is Santa Ana really wants the defenders of the fort to not get any sleep at night. Okay, and during the day, he'd end up actually having his soldiers attack from different angles, you know, at these different points. Um, they wouldn't get over the wall ever, um, these small little attacks, but they were to test the defenders and keep them constantly on edge for basically several weeks, right? From February 23rd to March 6th. And so after this period of time, finally, on March 5th, Santa Ana tells his men, don't fire the cannons tonight. And everyone thinks, yay, we finally have a night's rest. And so everyone in the fort starts falling asleep that night, and even the defenders on the walls that normally have to stay up all night keeping an eye out for the enemy end up falling asleep as well in a few places. And at midnight, sorry, 10 o'clock at night on March 5th, the... Um, Mexican army is basically snuck up to the edge of the wall and starts climbing over the wall in all of these different places um, and attacking, as well as attacking from other places elsewhere, to the point where it gets the defenders end up having to retreat off the wall and kind of start fighting all the way back in this area and all the way back into the fort itself, the 100 or so defenders, or 200 or so defenders. Um, the v battle is very vicious. Um, it lasts about 90 minutes or about two hours, give or take, um, from 10 p.m. to midnight. And by the end, at midnight on March 6th, okay, um, March 5th to 6th, that is, there's only about like three or four survivors, um, possibly including one or two members of these guys. We're not exactly sure. From what we do know, we know that William Travis was actually killed very early on the battle. Um, and we do know that Jim Bowie... Um, uh, was killed during the battle as well. Um, he was very um, sick during this entire period. He ended up having actually um, 
gout, a couple other diseases, possibly tuberculosis, um, and also a couple STDs, um, which kind of made him bedridden, um, where he couldn't really move. And he was actually next to his knife, um, ready for the defender, uh, for the enemy to break into the room. And that's where he ends up dying in his bed, supposedly, where he ends up, um, trying to stab a couple of the Mexican soldiers as they break into the room. Um, to kill him, and that's where he dies. Davy Crockett possibly lived to the next morning, where he was executed, along with a couple of the other soldiers that had surrendered. Most of the family members are also killed in the battle. Um, we do know that there were only about three survivors of the battle, of the entire um, 185 to 260 people that um, were in the Alamo, the defending it, um, including the family members. Only about three survived. Um, several of them left a couple days beforehand, um, but we do know a woman named Susanna Dickinson survived, and she tells the story of um, several of them being um, executed the next morning, possibly also Davy Crockett, like I said. Um, and then Joe, who is actually Travis, um, William Travis's slave, um, William Travis's, his actual slave, Joe, um, survived the fight um, and surrendered and basically learned one or two phrases in Mexican, um, where he basically or in Spanish, rather, um, to tell the Mexican army, saying, I, I surrender, I'm a slave, you know, please don't hurt me, I'm just here because I was forced to be here, is what he basically learned in Spanish. And so when the soldiers end up conquering most of the fort, the Mexican soldiers conquer the fort, he basically starts yelling that out with his hands up in the air, and the Mexican army ignores him, like, okay, yeah, he's, you know, he wasn't supposed to be here, <laughs> we'll, we'll li let him live, kind of thing. But um, this battle is an absolute tragedy because a lot of family members are killed, those that didn't leave. Um, and so we do know it's absolutely horrific what happened in the fort that night, that all the fighting. Um, but it does actually kind of get that story told because of, you know, Susanna Dickinson tells the story of what happened. And Sam Houston hears about what happened. And so on March 2nd, a few days before the Alamo fell, um, he actually decides to... Um, declare Texas as its own independent republic, which at this time, this was Texas at the time, what it looked like. And so he declares Texas as its own independent republic and country. Um, although to do that, you have to kind of win the, you know, win the whole kind of revolt. So he ends up having to fight still, and he hears about what happened with the Alamo, and he decides, okay, well, I'm going to tell everybody in my army what happened at the Alamo, um, thanks to Susanna's story. And so he tells them all, and he ends up actually finding a place where Santa Ana's army, the rest of the army after the Battle of the Alamo, is camping right near a river called San Jacinto River. And so what he ends up doing, um, Sam Houston actually sneaks up to where Santa Ana is camping, and he has his entire army surprise attack the Mexican army um, by running across the river and running across the small little bridge that's next to the river, or crosses the river. And on April 21st in, eight, in 1836, this 18-minute battle of the Battle of San Jacinto River takes place, where roughly about a thousand uh, Texans fight about against about 1,500 to um, actually 1,300 uh, Mexican soldiers under Santa Ana, and 11 Texans are killed, but 650 Mexicans uh, in the Mexican army are killed in this 18-minute battle. Santa Ana is even captured himself, and this right there gives Sam Houston that bargaining chip to actually make the Lone Star Republic actually official. Okay, yes, they declared it just like the Declaration of Independence, but did the Declaration of Independence really make America? No, what it took was that Treaty of Paris, right, to really give us freedom. Well, this is exactly their version of the Treaty of Paris, where basically they've taken control of Santa Anna by kidnapping him or capturing him at this battle, and they basically force him and say, look, you can either give us freedom, okay, and let us have this portion of Mexico, aka Texas, or we'll kill you. Um, and Santa Ana basically has no choice but to say, yes, okay, fine. <laughs> and so um, Santa Ana is forced to give up Texas, and of course Texas becomes the Lone Star Republic, or the Republic of Texas as it is also known as. And that lasts from March 2nd, 1836, um, really unofficially April 21st, 1836, right, um, to February 19th, 1846, when eventually, um, 
1846, Texas is annexed as a part of America, okay, and we'll get to that later on. Um, annexation of Texas actually becomes a really big debate topic in the 1844 election, um, and so uh, we'll talk about that next time, but um, I do want to get to a few other subjects before ending um, this session. So first up is the 1840 election. Um, the 1840 election is hold, held from October 30th to December 2nd of 1840, and we've got three parties actually trying for the presidency. We've got the Whig Party, which again was opposed Jackson. Well, Jackson's not around anymore, but Jackson's, you know, supporters kind of still are, and many of those that still support his policies are, um, including Martin Van Buren of the Democratic Party, which again, a very different Democratic Party than today. And remember, the Whig Party that had for, or the Republican Party that had formed is kind of gone now, okay, as you can see. So political parties do change. They come and go and then come back, right? Um, the Liberty Party is here um, under James G. Burney and Thomas Earle. Um, and Martin Van Buren actually didn't officially change choose anybody as vice president, as we'll see in a minute. The major issue of this is the Panic of 1837, which is going to last for two more years. Um, it's going to take the next president to really solving it. Martin Van Buren's kind of done some patchwork on it um, with a couple rules and laws, but really that economic depression is still going. Um, and so let's talk a little bit about the Whig Party. Um, we've got William Henry Harrison. He's from Virginia. We've talked about him before. Um, he was a U.S. Senator and member of the House of Representatives for Ohio. He then became governor of Indiana um, before it was even a state. Um, it was back then it was a territory. And then he was a general in the War of 1812. And then he also became minister to Grand Columbia in South America. Um, he ran as a presidential election member, um, trying to win the presidential election in 1832 eight years prior, but lost. And then he didn't come back in 1836. He just decided, oh, I'm going to sit this one out. But he decides in 1840 to come back for the Whig Party. And the Whig Party is really happy about this, okay? They really wanted him as, this, as their pick. Um, the Democratic Party, however, laughs at him. Because at the time, William Henry Harrison was 71 years old running for presidency. Back then, that was really, really old. Even today, it's regarded as old when becoming president or, you know, running for political office and stuff. And so in 1840, he's 71 years old, and the Democrats laugh, like, oh gosh, this guy's so old, you know, is the joke going around. Um, same as, same thing as happens now in their elections. He decides to run with a man named John Tyler. And I've talked about John Tyler before quickly. He actually ran as a vice presidential candidate in 1832 as well, um, under, um, um, under the candidates of White and Mangum. Okay, we talked about that last time, but White and Mangum were who he decided to be vice president for, possibly, either one of them. Um, but of course, both of them lost, so he never was vice president. Um, he's from Virginia, current senator of Virginia, former governor of Virginia. And so Virginia is the second largest state back then. And that's a lot of political votes, right, is the idea. And it's interesting because the Whig Party decided to do something different or relatively new back then. And they tried to come up with catchy campaign slogans. And one of them actually worked out really well. It's called Tippy Canoe and Tyler Two, because William Henry Harrison was the hero of the Battle of Tippy Canoe. Remember that battle against Tenska Watawa, the prophet, the Native American that decided to make his own town called Prophetstown in Indiana, when the Indiana people of Indiana were beginning to settle out that area, and were and the Native Americans under Tenska Watawa or the Shawnee brothers, Tenska Watawa and his younger brother Tecumseh, fought back against the uh, against them. Well, Tippy Canoe was the little river where Tenska Watawa was killed. Okay, and so that Tippy Canoe and Tyler too, it kind of rhymes, right, or is catchy, right, because of John Tyler, is that Tyler too, uh, or Tyler as well, right, is that version of two. And so that's a little phrase that they could say, and it's kind of, you know, rhyming phrases and stuff for political candidates are really catchy, okay, and so it catches on with people. And that helps elections, believe it or not. Um, <laughs> there's been studies on this. Um, there's also, they also run the Log Cabin and Hard Cider campaign. is kind of one of their other kind of sticks. Um, where they've got, yes, the Tippy Canoe and Tyler Two with a little song or 
a little poem quickly with some music behind it, um, which if they would have had TV commercials, I'm sure they would have had them playing in the background. Um, but they also have a hard cider campaign is the idea, and log cabins in all these pictures for hoping to get um, William Henry Harrison elected. And why did they come up with the log cabin and hard cider campaign? Well, actually, the Democrats came up for it for him. Um, and it was at first used as an insult against William Henry Harrison, saying that this guy would rather sit on a barrel drinking cider and partying in a log cabin or outside a log cabin all day long rather than being president. There's no way this man should be president if he's just going to be drinking basically alcoholic cider, okay? Um, and wants to hang out in log cabins. Let's, th that's not cut out for being a presidential person. However, Harrison and the Whigs, okay, came up with, or his campaign team, realized that's also kind of catchy. Because what we can do is say, wouldn't you rather someone that was a common style person in America, or a common man, running for the White House, and represent you regular people of America, as opposed to some, some stuffy guy like Martin Van Buren, who's been a politician for a long time, and, you know, is just this big issue that we've been having with these rich people being in charge of America. And so it actually backfires against Democrats when the Whigs start using this. Okay, so back to the uh, election otherwise. Well, like I said, Van Buren couldn't really pick a vice presidential candidate. There were multiple different people. He never actually officially picks one. Um, but the um, Electoral College, when they actually end up having to, those that, states that voted for Van Buren, basically choose their own decision on who they want. And that's between Littleton W. Taswell, um, Richard Mentor Johnson, or James K. Polk. Um, interesting fact about James K. Polk is he actually will become president in the future. Um, uh, however, the Democratic Party at this time were blamed for the Panic of 1837 under Van Buren because he, as well as his predecessor, another Democrat, Andrew Jackson, had caused it, right? And so they're going to hit the blame, and the Whigs decide not only to use, you know, these two catchy phrases to help them out, themselves out, they actually start coming up with a catchy phrase against Van Buren by calling him Van Ruin, okay? That he ruined the country. Van Buren ruined the country, or Van Ruin ruined the country, was the thing they kept on saying over and over again, and stuff in debates. Um, and so, um, the Whigs, I mean, the Whigs kind of really are doing a great job at messaging, while the Democratic Party, um, was not. And then lastly, we have the Liberty Party. James Gillespie Burney and Thomas Earle. Um, Burney was from Virginia, and it was a lawyer and a member of the state congress of Alabama and Kentucky. Um, really not really big, impressive political, um, uh, backing, but it's a little something. And then we have Thomas Earle from Massachusetts, who's a lawyer and a journalist and newspaper editor from Pennsylvania, um, or in Pennsylvania. And so he's not really big politically at all. Um, and why are they a factor? Well, the Liberty Party is getting votes from people that want abolition. Okay, the Liberty Party's sole idea and the only thing they run on, they don't run on any other political idea at all. They just say, we want to abolish slavery. We want to free the slaves. That's it. That's all they're running on. Whenever asked about any other issue, they just kind of deflect the question to, we should free the slaves. Um, and so that does get some voters to vote for them, but not many. In fact, only 6,797 people across the entire country end up voting for the Liberty Party in this election. While we have 1 million or 1 point, almost actually 1.275 million um, people across the country are voting for William Henry Harrison and John Tyler of the Whig Party. For the Democratic Party, Martin Van Buren gets 1,128,000 votes. Um, actually, there that zero should not be there, so ignore that. Um, anyway, moving on. <laughs> so um, if you compare it, you can see the Electoral College votes, where we have 234 Electoral College votes for William Henry Harrison, with 53% of the entire nation voting for him population-wise, while Van Buren only gets 60 Electoral votes with 47%. And even though they're very close... Um, and percentage-wise, population-wise, as well as vote-wise, number of votes, the 
electoral college vote number is very different because again remember it's basically winner takes all in states in most states and so um uh electoral college wise and so it does kind of skew things on the electoral side um moving on obviously william henry harrison becomes president and in january of that year um or february of that year he will actually have um a uh inauguration speech february or march that is um and he actually dies in office soon after that inauguration speech he actually dies on april 4th 1841 okay um and how, why did this happen okay well he's for note he is the first american president to die while in office he was the oldest elected american president at the time 71 years old we have had older ones elected since okay um, he actually decided to ride his horse to the inauguration speech at the Capitol building, okay, from the White House, um, on his own. He rode his horse as opposed to being in a carriage. It was extremely cold and wet weather. It was raining. He didn't wear a large overcoat because he wanted to wear his suit and show off that he was wearing his suit to everybody. He didn't even wear a hat, which was customary while riding horses in bad weather, um, or just walking around in bad weather because they didn't really have very good umbrellas back then. Um, and so he also, once he got to the Capitol building, he gave a very, very long inauguration speech, two and a half hour long speech, okay? Typical inauguration speeches last about an hour. They're televised, okay? Tons of people turn out to the Capitol building for it usually and watch them. Um, and so even in bad weather, people go and watch them today, okay? But back then, this two and a half hour long speech was extremely long, longer than even most are today, okay? And they're always long today even. But he's outside giving this speech, not really wearing a large co a coat um, or thick coat, and he gets sick. He ends up getting sick very soon after the inauguration speech, like within a day or two, but he seems to get better. However, 31 days after the inauguration, he does die on April 4th, 1841. Um, and he died only after 31 days. It is the shortest presidency in American history. No one has ever been president for a shorter period of time. And he died from pneumonia, possibly due to the inauguration speech, okay, and the cold and rain during that speech. Um, but he did get better for a few days after. Um, so maybe he got sick another way, okay, and got pneumonia from another outing on it but a lot of people blame his inauguration speech in fact growing up a lot of kids are told this story where make sure to wear your coat otherwise you'll die like william henry harrison um was kind of the old uh, kind of tale that they used to tell um for a very long time um in america <laughs> moving on who becomes president after the um after the president dies well back then it never really came up even though it's kind of said well in the constitution um, it is in Article 2, Section 1, Clause 6 of the Constitution says what happens. It says removal of the president from office or his death, resignation or inability to discharge the powers and duties of said office, the same shall devolve on the vice president. Basically stating, yes, the vice president becomes president right away, okay, is the idea of what this says right here. However, because... This was the first time the president had ever died or not been able to be act as president for any reason. There was controversy. And the question is, does the vice president actually become the next president, okay, or does he only act as president until another election can be held? Because that's really questionable, okay? And so back then, it had never really been discussed, where, yes, you get those powers, okay, is what this says, but it doesn't say they become vice president, I mean, they, the vice president automatically becomes president, does it? It just says the powers of the office, powers and duties of the office of presidency go to the vice president's, vice president. It doesn't say the vice president also becomes president. It doesn't say that. And so the cabinet, which William Henry Harrison had already picked and gotten in, basically start meeting and talking and they decide that the vice president should only actually be an acting president and that they should immediately hold an election across the entire country to elect a new guy. Hopefully one of them is what they're kind of all discussing. And John Tyler, however, Vice President John Tyler is like, yeah, no, I don't like that. And he reads this 
And he's like, okay, well, that's clear to me. And so he actually goes and has a Supreme Court judge or one of the judges elsewhere in Washington come to him and actually swears himself in immediately. He actually has a judge come and actually have him do the swearing on the Bible, and he becomes president while the cabinet is basically discussing what to do. Um, and so John Tyler becomes president. This becomes known as the Tyler precedent, where this little part right here is now... Yes, it still says that in the Constitution, but now because we've got a precedent, meaning previous person has done this, okay, where the vice president gets elect, gets not elected, but moved into the position of president right away on the president's death, that's what happens now, okay? And so whenever the vice president um, becomes president, it's thanks to this guy. Okay, um, when they become vice president, I mean, president after like a tragedy of the president. Okay, um, he becomes actually the youngest president. I mean, president at this time, fifty-one years old, which is kind of interesting. Um, where we had in back-to-back, -back, you know, days or even the same day, the oldest president and now the youngest president at the same time. Um, uh, and so um, arguments actually begin between him and the cabinet because he immediately goes and says, I'm president to the cabinet. I've had myself sworn in on the Bible and the Constitution. I'm in charge now. I'm full on president, not just holding the powers of vice, I mean, of president until an election can happen. And the cabinet is like, whoa, we didn't say you could do that. And he's like, well, no, you didn't, but the Constitution kind of did. Um, not exactly, but close. And so he says, if you want to cooperate with me, then you would be welcome to stay on my cabinet as my cabinet members. Otherwise, I expect you to resign. And in fact, several of them actually do resign immediately after um, because they don't want to work with him. Um, or, or threaten to resign as well, and he basically has to almost fire them, which is basically forcing them to resign. And so, um, yeah, we end up actually having a kind of minor constitutional crisis on whether he, what he did was constitutional or not, but that's what ends up happening now, is whenever the president dies, or is unable to be president for whatever reason, um, the vice president takes over, okay? But that is not originally possibly what was meant to happen, okay? Um, moving on, let's talk a little bit about immigration in America for a few minutes. Immigration in America um, becomes a really big deal in the 17, uh, 1790s to 1800s, and in fact, the Naturalization Act is passed by Congress in 1790, where it says citizenship is given to free whites, okay, as long as they make two, two passing things, okay, as long as two things are um, are required of free white people in America if they're from somewhere else. One is they have lived here for two years in the United States, okay, and two, they have to be of good character, okay, and good character can kind of vary, right, it depends on who who's thinking that, right, um, but a lot of people do end up coming to America during this period of time. As you can see, a huge amount of people end up coming to this period um, from all over places. Ireland, Germany, Great Britain, um, other places in the Americas. So um, Mexico, the Caribbean, South America, Canada, even Scandinavia, meaning Norway and Sweden and Denmark, and then other countries as well. Okay. And so a huge amount of people end up coming to America during this period of time. And you can kind of see on this map um, where a lot of people ended up going. Um, if they went to the orange places, it's very rare that they were very um, immigrant, um, had many immigrants. Most of the green places had quite a few immigrants, like 10 to 20 percent of the population was was immigration from immigration. And if they were yellow, it was 20 percent or more um, people were actually immigrants. Um, new immigrants, that is. Um, many sick or died um, upon their arrival to America, okay? Immigration was not necessarily safe coming to America. A lot of people went on ships, okay, obviously from around the world um, coming here, and it was very cramped conditions like this with small beds on the ships, um, and really cramped unsanitary conditions, um, really horrible, disgusting conditions. Um, and in 1819, Congress passed an act saying that we need to change things. 
better shipboard conditions need to happen for any ship coming to America, regardless of whether it has immigrants on it or if it has just any other people coming to America, you know, coming, coming and going like trading to America was the idea. Was like, let's establish a standard level of what should be going on on ships kind of thing, um, conditions wise. And so, um, this actually caused better conditions to happen. Um, it was almost impossible to f enforce though. Um, um, because basically who's going to be enforcing it? Well, kind of the Coast Guard, but are they going to really be able to do anything to force ship captains to do this? Well, they can turn a ship away, but does that actually help the immigrants on board if they've been on there for a couple months traveling at sea? No, it's actually probably worse to send that ship away than actually just have them come here and then still be sick and try to get them better afterwards. Captains also were required in the Steerage Act to record demographic data on immigrants. So they had basically had to poll who was coming and say, okay, well, the, where these people are coming from here and then give those records to the American government afterwards. Immigration from the 1820s to 1860s saw a lot of Germans come to America, okay? Um, if your family is part German at all, you could possibly um, actually trace your um, family back to this period of America when they first came. They might have come earlier or they might have come since, but a lot of people with German descendants um, here in America came during this, their families originally came to America during this period of time, the 20s to 60s of the 1800s. About 5 million Germans came to the United States during this 40-year period. Many of them went to the Midwest. So this area, especially Minnesota and Wisconsin, um, but a few other places as well. They settled in places such as St. Louis, Cincinnati, and Milwaukee. And Milwaukee becomes a really big place for beer due to this. The Germans love their beer, okay? In fact, um, two families that were actually famous um, or became famous later on for making beer, actually came to America during this period of time. They were the Anheuser family and the Bush family. And we have Adolphus Bush pictured here, where his family actually sold winemaking supplies as well as brewery supplies, meaning beer making supplies, to other people in the area of Milwaukee, okay, and St. Louis areas, okay. He ends up actually marrying a young woman named Lily Anheuser, okay. Her father was a German um, immigrant, and her father was actually partnered um, with a part uh, with another partner, which we don't know, or isn't named here, okay, don't worry about his name, um, actually owned a brewery called the Anheuser Brewery um, in St. Louis, Missouri. And so when a man that actually makes or sells the supplies um, to make beer and wine marries a brewer um, in St. Louis, ends up kind of merging into a bigger company. And this merging of these two families actually creates the Anheuser-Busch Brewery in 1869. And... You may know that name, right? It's one of the biggest beer manufacturers in America, Anheuser-Busch today. Um, moving on, we also have the Irish end up coming a lot in America during, coming to America during this period of time. From 1845 to 1847, we have the Irish potato blight um, in, um, in Ireland. And what ends up happening with that? Well, it's a famine, okay? The potato famine is what it really is known as, okay? Um, the blight is another name for famine or disease. And what is this? Well, back then in Ireland, the people of Ireland ate 80 to 99% of their diet was just potatoes, okay? Because they didn't really have much else in, Amer in, in Ireland to really grow or really be able to actually um, harvest much. Nothing really grew much always. They didn't have the crops for it. They didn't have, they weren't wealthy enough to have lots of cows or sheep or anything like that or livestock to eat meat. And so they would just grow potatoes and potatoes just grew and grew and grew in Ireland easy. Um, and so they would actually eat about 14 pounds a day of potatoes every single day, every single person in Ireland. Well, a the potato crop in Ireland was actually infected with a fungus where it would make nice, pretty brown potatoes look like this, um, where they wouldn't look too nice. But people would think, oh, it's okay, you know, it, you know, just cook it and you'll be fine. Um, what this fungus was was actually called Phytophthora infestans. That was the name of the uh, 
fungus, and about one million people died in Ireland due to either eating this or eating infected uh, fungus-infected potatoes um, and getting sick from it, or not being able to eat because their entire crop of potatoes was infected by the fungus and they're like, oh no, don't touch those ones, they're bad, they'll make you sick. And so what did they eat? Well, they didn't really eat much of anything, they starved to death. Between 1845 and 1855, so 10-year period, about 1.5 million Irish people left Ireland, they emigrated to the United States. They immigrated to the United States or emigrated from Ireland. Emigrated is leaving, immigration is coming, right, to a place. They ended up coming to America and they ended up working on canals, roads, railroads, as other, as, as well as in factories, okay? Um, mostly through northern parts of the United States. From the period of 1840 to 1924, we actually have 30 million, at least 30 million, European immigrants that are documented as coming to the country. At least 30 million. It could be quite a bit higher than that for those that were undocumented, but for the most part, we have really good records of this. From 1850 onwards, a lot of people from China started coming to the West Coast, to basically California, which eventually becomes American um, in the 1850s, and we'll get to that in another lecture. But they came to the West Coast, and they ended up actually working on railroads and roads over in the California area, as well as the out west, outs on the western side of the United States. Most of these immigrants, whether they be European ones from Ireland, Germany, or even um, the Chinese or other countries, um, really did a lot of work for very low wages, okay, and were also very much discriminated against, okay, major discrimination against um, them as well. Moving on, we've got 1820 to 1860, we've got one third of the immigrants coming from Ireland, mostly are Catholic, many of them go to the New York City and Boston area. Other significant numbers that had come before the 1860s were really the British coming to America, and that was what? During colonization, right? And that was about it. After 1850, most of American immigrants were actually from China, and then after 1850, um, many also started coming from Canada. And we've got this little um, video here. It's not going to work today. I don't really have time to show you it, but it shows where different countries are. Mexico, Canada, a couple places in South uh, Central America, um, Ireland here is that little red dot right next to it, Britain, okay, which is that yellow um, there. We've got France, Germany there, all um, coming to America, okay. Those are the main countries that sent, um, that had come, people come here during this period of time. But despite all of the um, immigrants coming, um, that doesn't mean that they were always welcomed, okay. Even though they were willing to do hard work for very cheap amounts of money given to them, People did really find that quite, find them coming here not, not very happy. They did not like that. In the 1830s to 1860s, we end up having a group of people calling themselves the nativists, meaning that they believed that they were the, quotes, Native Americans. Now, were they Native Americans? No, they are not actual Native Americans as in the Indians, okay? Or Native Americans that were, you know, generations upon generations being here. Um, uh, from before European expansion. No, these are actual Europeans, uh, mostly white, almost all of them white, um, and had been here since what? Colonies? Since the colonies? Or even in later years after America became its own country? Um, and so they decided that even though they're descended from immigrants, they actually start calling themselves the nativists because they say that they are the first Americans, okay? Um, they're against further immigration from anywhere. Doesn't matter who you're where you're from, they don't like immigrants. They also say that only native-born people, people born here in America, should have rights at all, and that immigrants should have no rights whatsoever. Um, they also are heavily against Catholics. Um, in fact, they hated the Catholics more so than anybody else, um, or more so than any other group of na um, immigrants, even though they really hated immigrants from everywhere. Just if you were Catholic and an immigrant, they hated you extra. Um, and they really decided not to like the immigrants because they had kind of seen what had happened in the past in Europe, where the popes sometimes had control of countries at times. Um, although that hadn't happened for a long time in Europe, they were afraid of that happening again in America. And so they made political 
political cartoons where it showed like the Pope was on like a telegraph wire or a phone call, you know, making decisions in Italy in as in the Vatican for America and other places where he would have his hand on Washington, you know, curtain of religion um, and stuff like that. And he should be ruling America is what um, basically they inspired in all of these fear making political cartoons. OK, and so they were heavily against Catholic immigrants. Um, um, and it's, this ends up actually leading to quite a few riots in cities across America during this period of time. Um, pictured here, and it's one cartoon actually in a newspaper, um, is a major riot in Philadelphia. Moving on, um, one of the most famous nativists was a man named Samuel Morse. Samuel Morse lived from 1791 to 1872. You might know him from one of his inventions, um, the telegraph and Morse code. Um, well, he didn't exactly invent the uh, telegraph, but he came up with a way to send messages via the telegraph. Um, he did develop a version of the telegraph called the electric telegraph. They had earlier versions beforehand that didn't work well. So, yeah, I guess we can credit him with having the telegraph as well. But um, big thing is Morse code, which, you know, um, you might have learned in Boy Scouts or Girl Scouts or some other kind of club or whatever, maybe, or in the military it's taught still, where it's dots and dashes, those little beeps and longer pauses between the beeps where you kind of hear in movies, sometimes it's beep, 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 beep. Well, each of them are different little letters or numbers, and you end up deciphering that on the other side of the wire, hearing that all, and writing down the dots and dashes, um, and you get letters and eventually words, right? Um, he was actually heavily um, influenced by the nativists, um, and was considered him a member of their group, um, and he was heavily against Catholic immigrants as well, um, and uh, but he did develop the electric telegraph, which is very important for basically everybody around the world. Um, the telegraph becomes very useful, as well as Morse code becomes very useful. Morse code was not only just used from wire to wire like telephones, old Tuscal style telephones, but also used by ships. They would actually use um, basically lanterns or big giant spotlights um, to you know, do the different code. Um, we're going to talk about the railroads, and then we'll end the lecture there. Um, I know I'm going a little bit long, but here's the railroads. In 1804 to 1825, the first steam locomotives were developed around the world, ever, anywhere, and they were developed in Britain, okay? By 1825, British locomotives and rails, okay, because no one had really come up with this beforehand, were brought to America for the first time, by 1825. Okay. However, there were very, very few of them in 1825. In 1830, a, f a train was actually first ever built here in America. Okay. The, well, they had had ones in Britain, obviously, as well as other countries by this time. But the first ever American built one was named Tom Thumb. Okay. And it was built in the year 1830. And it was built at the West Point Foundry in New York State. And it was designed by a name, a man named Peter Cooper. And this is what it looked like. Now, this actually picture is actually not of Tom Thumb at all, because even by the year 1927, it had been destroyed or just fallen apart. However, they did make a replica of it in 1927, which you can see in a museum. You can't see the original. The original one is gone. Um, but yes, Tom Thumb, Peter Cooper's Tom Thumb. That's what it looked like. Very different from trains today, right? Or even trains back then, which looked more like this. And so railroads, financing for railroads at first in America was terrible, okay? People that owned turnpikes and canals objected to these railroads being built. They wanted people to use their canals or their nice regular roads for a toll, um, toll price to use those. Otherwise, what is going to happen to them? They're going to lose money. People are going to start using trains. However, eventually... Trains become more important back then than roads did, okay? Remember, cars weren't around back then. You had to take wagons or horses everywhere. And if you wanted to send large amount of goods, canals on boats or even rivers. However, over time, this faster transportation of goods on these locomotives, steam locomotives driven by coal, worked really well. Huge numbers of workers started making railroads and the rails themselves. They also had to lay the track because you can't just make the rail and 
it places itself, right? It has to be placed by workers. Um, didn't even have really machines to do that back then. Um, and they also had to build bridges and dig tunnels through mountains or hills, as opposed to going over the mountain or hill, right? Many immigrants ended up actually helping with this work. The Irish helped in the West, or especially the, you know, north area of the West. And then, or sorry, the East, sorry, the East Coast. Um, so New York, um, Boston, Massachusetts areas, all the way out to the mid east, um, um, middle, uh, Midwest area, um, like around the uh, Great Lakes region is where the Irish helped. Um, while the Chinese ended up doing so in California and also out west, like to Nevada areas and stuff. Moving on to in the 1830s, we ended up having a huge boom of railroads. Okay, at first there were only a few dozen miles of rail across the entire country, like. A couple hundred miles. That's about it. About a few dozen. Okay, a few dozen miles in 1830. By 1840, within 10 years, the amount of railroad had been ra laid in these purple lines of the railroads back then. Okay, 4,500 miles. Now that doesn't seem like a lot by looking at this map, but that's quite a lot of mileage in only 10 years being made. Okay, by 1850, that amount of railroad that had been laid is down up to 23,000 miles of railroad. A lot more. But as you can see, there's very little in the south. It's mostly up in the north area and in this area here as well. Also the north, okay? The south didn't really build much. By 1850 to 1860, the amount of railroads went from 23,000 to triple that. So in the 60s, okay? 69,000, give or take, maybe even more, okay? More than tripled. And as you can see in this map, this is from 1860, okay, right before the Civil War, um, that amount of rail, especially in the north, less so in the south. A couple big cities like Atlanta has a bunch, um, as you can see in this one, Atlanta, Chattanooga, um, New Orleans even has it, um, but really in the south, not so much. Um, railroads had increased in the amount of settlements out here, especially, because people start could go, go from these places out west very easily and start having new towns and cities built out here. The South, however, built very few railroads because they didn't want to. They wanted to keep things not urbanized yet. And so that's where we're going to end. We'll talk about other um, topics next time, um, a bunch of different topics, including the Mexican-American War. Have a great day and see you on Tuesday.